in the praises of your people. So we lift our hands and we lift our heart as we offer our this praise unto your name. Come on, lift up your hands and tell the Lord, you desire, you desire to abide in the praise. Come on, let me hear you. So we lift, so we lift our hands and we lift our hearts as we offer up this praise unto your name. As we offer up this praise unto your name, as we offer up, as we offer up this praise unto your name, as we offer up this praise unto your name, we offer up this praise unto you, Lord. You are worthy, Lord, you are worthy. He's worthy of all the praise. No matter what your situation might be today, I don't know what you're going through, but the Lord, He knows what you're going through. So all we could do is just lift up our hands and let the Lord take care of the rest. That's all we could do. As we lift our hands, no matter what you're going through, he knows your problems. Here's his problem. My problem is his problem. My sickness is his sickness. He knows why you're going. As we offer up this praise unto your name. As we offer up this praise unto your name. As we offer up, as we offer up this praise unto your name. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. You are welcome in this place. 
You are welcome in this place. Holy Spirit,
rain down, Lord. Rain down, Holy Spirit. Rain down, rain down, rain down, rain down. We need to feel your presence, Lord. Not another Sunday, but a different Sunday, Lord Jesus. We get to do it again. We're back on the Sunday. Let's make the best of it, amen. I need your help with your hands. Come on. I think you got it, right? Uh. Ah. Come on. Come on, guys. You're finished while you started. Come on, guys. You won't start. Come on, guys. Hey. You're pressing in every step. Patient with every heartache. God, you have never failed. Come on, everybody. We have this confidence. We have this confidence. You're finished.
say I am. I am who you say I, I, am. I am. Come on, sing it. Sing it with power. I, I am, am who you say, say I am. I only one. How many old people are in the house? I better not see no hands. Come on, we're all young. <laughs> Every praise is to our God. Come on. Every word of worship. Every praise. Come on. Every praise is to our God. You got sound beautiful. Sing hallelujah. Glory, hallelujah. Every praise. Every praise is to our God. Every praise is to our God. Every word of worship. Every word of worship with one of Say 
That's all, I got three minutes. One more. Another goodie here. Save us, restore us. Come on. Revive us, oh Lord. Come on, sing it like you mean it. Savior, save us, restore us, restore us, revive us, oh Lord, oh Lord, oh Lord, oh Lord, on your house with your It's so good to be with you uh, this morning and to be able to, to share with you from the Word of God. Uh, I've entitled my teaching this morning, uh, The Most Excellent Way. The Most Excellent Way. Now, these are the last four words of the Apostle Paul as he is closing out the 12th chapter of 1 Corinthians, where he's talking about spiritual gifts and it is a bridge into chapter 13 where he's talking about love, which Paul expresses here in these four words as being the most excellent way. Now, the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19, that when you place your faith in Jesus Christ for your salvation, that God's Holy Spirit takes up residence in your life. And your body now actually becomes the dwelling place of God's spirit. When Paul said in verse 19, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? The word temple that Paul uses here, it comes from a Greek word which literally means holy of holies. What Paul is saying here is that your body now actually becomes the holy of holies, the very tabernacle of God's spirit. Now, when God's Spirit takes up residence in your life, the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 that God endows you with spiritual gifts. Now, these gifts are different than your natural aptitudes. And Paul lists these gifts in part in chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians. It's only a partial list. Now, God gives us these gifts to equip us for ministry 
And yet, sometimes with all of our focus on our, our giftings and on our equipping and on our ministries, we can miss the very foundation upon which our ministries need to be built and through which these gifts need to be expressed, and that is love. Love. God gives us these gifts to help us reach people for Christ. But you need to understand, friend, that your gifts do not win people for Christ. God gives us these gifts to help us reach people for Christ, but your gifts do not win people for Christ. No, it is love that wins people for Christ. And so I want to take a few moments this morning, and I want to challenge you to allow love to find its proper place in your life and in your ministry, whether your ministry is at home with your family, whether it is at work, at school, in the neighborhood, the apartment complex, in the marketplace, or amongst the fellowship of believers. Now, in these four words, the most excellent way, there are two implications I want us to get a hold of as we begin. Okay, the first is the implication of value. Value. To say that something is the most excellent implies that it is being compared to something or perhaps several other things that are less excellent. And so the implication here is that there is more than one way. And although these other ways may be good and even hold some level of excellence, they are not as excellent as the most excellent way. Therefore, the most excellent way, it is of the highest value. It is the greatest virtue. Actually... This phrase, most excellent, that Paul uses here, it gets translated from a Greek term, which means beyond measure. It is beyond measure. You can't even measure it. You can't even put a price on it. You can't put a price on love, can you? You cannot buy love, although a lot of people try. Love, it is in fact priceless. And so the first implication we see here is one of value. The second is seen with Paul saying that it is a way. Now, this implies it could be one of several things. It could be a way as in a direction, a path, a course that leads from one place to another. It could be a way as in your manner of being, the the essence of who you are as a person. It's It's just your way. Or it can be a way as in the means of attaining something. Now, in the context that Paul is using it here, I believe he's implying it's the way to several things, perhaps all of the above. It's certainly the way to be, as in your essence and sense of being as a person. It's the way to God. It's the, lead, it's the way to lead others to saving faith in Christ. It's the way to find healing from life's hurts. It's the way to restoration and reconciliation in relationships. It's the way to find meaning and purpose for your life. It is the way to help others find meaning and purpose for their lives. It is the way for the body of Christ, that is us, the church, to function as representatives of Christ on the earth. No wonder Paul said it is the most excellent way. <clears throat> Now, although I will be referencing several scriptures uh, throughout my teaching this morning, I want to begin with a quick overview of chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians, and then we're going to move right into chapter 13. Now, in, in chapter 12, Paul is speaking to the people in the church at Corinth here, and he wants to bring them a teaching now on spiritual gifts. And so in verse 1, he begins with the words, Now, about spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be ignorant. And so Paul is telling the people in Corinth here that he wants to inform them now about spiritual gifts. He he doesn't want them to be uninformed or misinformed. Verse 2, you know that when you were pagans, somehow or other, you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. So in this context of preparing the people to receive a teaching on spiritual gifts, Paul begins by reminding them that they were once pagans, and in their pagan customs, they were led astray. Now, what is a custom? Well, one definition I like defines a custom as a long, continued habit that is so established it has the force of law. You feel a sense of obligation and duty to uphold it. You feel guilt and conviction if you don't. Paul then goes on through verses 7 through 11 
of Corinthians 12, and he introduces this idea of spiritual gifts to the people and how they are given by God to individual members to be used for the common good. That is the good of the church, the corporate body of Christ. <clears throat> he then goes down through verse 26, and he uses the analogy of a human body, and he likens this unto the spiritual body of Christ, that is the church. Then in verses 27 through 30, he introduces another list of gifts that are to serve specific functions in helping the church function as a spiritual body. He then closes out this chapter with the words, and now I will show you the most excellent way. Now, this statement in this context implies that although there are gifts that God gives to the church, and some of these gifts are identified as being greater than others, there is still something else. There is still something else, and it is greater than the greatest of these gifts. It is the most excellent way. It is of the highest value. It is the greatest virtue. Now, from this statement, we move into chapter 13. Now, when Paul wrote this letter to the Corinthian church, we know that he did not write it in chapter and verse. So this is really a continuation of his last statement on spiritual gifts in chapter 12. Now, I want to I read the first three verses of chapter 13 to you. He begins with the words, If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames but have not love, I gain nothing. Now what I want you to see here is that in verse 27 of chapter 12, Paul tells us that each one of us is part of the body of Christ. Then in verse 28 of that same chapter, he tells us that God has appointed gifts to each member of the body. Now that's each one of us. Then throughout that chapter, he identifies what several of those gifts are. Then as we move into chapter 13, in the first three verses, he refers to each of the gifts he mentions in chapter 12 in terms of their function. If you look at how he has them grouped here, they're grouped according to function. And he says if we exercise any of these gifts without love, they are of no spiritual value to us. Now, certainly these gifts have temporal value. We need these gifts to maintain the operation of the institution of the church. But from a spiritual perspective, from an eternal perspective, Paul is saying that they will count for nothing if they are done without love. He said, I am nothing and I gain nothing. Now, that literally means nothing. Now, listen to how Paul equates this in verse 1 of chapter 13. This is really powerful to me, and I want you to understand what exactly it is Paul is trying to convey to his listeners both then and now. He begins with the words, If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels. Now, we already know that Paul can speak with the tongues of men because he's talking to them. But what does he mean if he could speak with the tongues of angels? It would mean that he could not only talk in an angelic language, which he does make reference to doing, but it would also mean that he would be able to use his voice like an angel uses their voice. If he could speak with the tongues of angels, he could use his voice like an angel uses their voice. Now, in the book of Hebrews, in chapter 1 and verse 14, the author tells us that angels are ministering spirits that are sent to serve those who will inherit salvation. Now, that's you and me. So Paul is saying here, even if he had the language of a ministering spirit, even if he could use his voice to minister to the body of Christ, if he were ministering without love, he would count for nothing. Now, let me ask you a question. Can you minister without love? 
Can you stand on a platform and preach a service and still have anger and unforgiveness in your heart towards someone? Yes, you can. Can you sing on the worship team, leading people into the presence of the Lord, into the presence of the very author of love himself, and yet still harbor attitudes of prejudice in your heart towards certain people, groups, or other members of your church? Yes, you can. Can you work in the church office representing the mission of God to the world and still be an angry, bitter, jealous, cynical person because of how unfair you think life has treated you? Yeah, you can. Can you be on the pastoral staff and be a pastor or an associate pastor or a deacon or an elder or a trustee or some kind of ministry leader in the church and then go home and be abusive to your partner and your children? Yes, you can. Can you lead a small group or a home Bible study and then gossip and slander and backbite other people in your church that you don't care for or agree with? <laughs> yes, you can. So you can minister without love. So if you're ministering and you're ministering without love, then what are you ministering out of? Is it out of a sense of obligation? Is it out of a sense of duty? Is it your, your custom? Do you minister because you think that's what you're supposed to do? You minister out of an attitude of pride, makes you feel good, makes you feel spiritual, powerful, and important? Well, you might not believe this one, but I even know people who minister out of guilt. Now, when we read this verse in, in Corinthians 13, this first verse, we, we typically think that, that Paul is saying that if we exercise any of the gifts he mentions in chapter 12, if we did them without love, we would be nothing more than a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. In other words, we would just be making a lot of noise. And although you could certainly look at it this way, that is not what Paul is implying here. Now, let me take you back to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 17, verse 16. Paul is in Athens here. And Athens in its day, it was the epicenter of culture and cultural diversity. Athens was a very culturally sophisticated city. And it wasn't a large city. It did not occupy a large footprint on the earth. And Paul is walking around this city, and he becomes distressed because of all the idolatry he sees in this city. In fact, uh, archaeologists uh, tell us that during this time when Paul was in Athens, archaeologists have uncovered over 30,000 statues that were erected throughout the city of Athens, paying homage to the various Athenian gods. Over 30,000 statues. Man, that's a lot of statues. And so Paul is walking around this city, and, and this is what he's looking at here. And he becomes distressed by all this idolatry. And so he begins to reason with the people, witnessing to them in their synagogues and in their marketplace about Jesus and the resurrection. Now, a group of philosophers hear him. And they engage him. And they bring him before the council of the Areopagus. Now, the Areopagus was a council that was made up of very wise and learned individuals. They commanded great respect amongst the people. And they were in charge of matters that had to deal with religion, education, the arts, and things that held social and cultural influence. And so Paul is being brought before this council. Now, this is not a punitive thing here. You see, they believe that Paul is introducing new religious ideas to the people. And they'd not heard any of these religious ideas before. And this was their area of responsibility. And so they wanted Paul to explain these new religious ideas to them. And so Paul, he stands up in front of this council. And in Acts chapter 17, verses 22 and 23, he begins his discourse by saying... Men of Athens, I see that you are very religious. 
For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. Now, even though these people were very religious and they were a culturally enriched people, they were also very much a pagan people. This was a pagan culture. They worshipped other gods. They worshipped so many other gods. And they were so superstitious. They were so afraid they might have left a god out. And they did not want to fall out of favor with any god they might have forgotten about. So they erected an altar to an unknown god in case they might have forgotten one. You see, as they would hold their worship services to their pagan gods, they would employ various objects of worship. And this is what Paul was looking carefully at when he said in Acts 7, 20, 17, 23, that he walked around and he looked carefully at their objects of worship. He was looking at specific things. Okay, now think about this for a moment. If some pagan were to walk into this sanctuary right now, and they were to walk around this sanctuary and they were to look at your objects of worship. What do you think they'd see? What would they identify as your objects of worship? Well, they came up on the platform over here. Uh, they may start by looking at this thing over here. Kind of a strange, thing. this keyboard over here. And then they're, they're going to look at this uh, percussion box here. And, and they're going to walk over and see this. This keyboard here, a computer, a, a mixing board. They're going to see some monitors. They're going to go down here, a microphone, microphone stand, and a, a guitar, and a congas, and a, a drum cage, and, and a drum set, and some of those little chime things. One very important and one very central feature of our worship is music. Wouldn't you agree? It's music. We play instruments and we sing as we worship the Lord. We did it just a few moments ago. Well, guess what? They did it too. Music was a really important part of their worship services. And one of their objects of worship were musical instruments. And two instruments that were central to their worship services as they worshiped their pagan gods were gongs and cymbals. Now, remember, when Paul begins to introduce this idea of spiritual gifts to the people back in chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians, he begins by reminding them that they were once pagans, and in their pagan customs, they were led astray. And remember, a custom is defined as a long-continued habit that's so established that it has the force of law. You feel a sense of obligation and duty to uphold it. You feel guilt and conviction if you don't. So what Paul is really saying here in verse 1 of Corinthians 13 when he says, if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. What he's saying here, he's saying if you minister for any reason other than love, you're no better off spiritually than you were when you were a pagan. When you were involved in your old religious practices. He's saying that somehow or other you have been influenced and led astray to think that doing ministry out of a sense of custom or obligation or duty is pleasing to the Lord, but it is not. Paul said, if you minister for any reason other than love, the God you're representing will remain to the people you are ministering to an unknown God. They will not see God in you or your ministry because 1 John 4, 8 says, he who does not love does not know God. God is unknown to them. Because God is love. Without love, your religious acts of service, well, they may help you feel very religious, but they will not help people see God. In fact, they may actually occlude or block people's view of God. Like Paul saw the men of Athens, they will just see you as some really religious person. But the God you're telling them about will remain to them an unknown God. So this begs the question then, how does God go from being an unknown God to a known God? How do people see God? 1 John 4.12 says that no one has ever seen God. So if no one has ever seen God, then how do people see God? You don't see God in church. You may experience a sense of his presence in church but you don't see God. 
you don't see God in a worship service. You may experience a sense of his presence in a worship service, but you don't see God. You, see, you may see God's Holy Spirit working in a person as they are broken and weeping before the Lord, but you don't see God. So if you don't see God, then how are people supposed to see God in the day-to-day -day moments and in the day-to-day -day interactions in their lives? 1 John 4, 8 says that God is love. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world, he gave. Well, what did he give? He gave his only begotten son. He gave us Jesus. So Jesus is the fullest expression of God's love. And so Jesus is living on the earth, and after his baptism, he begins the mission for which his father sent him. He begins by calling his 12 disciples, and he takes them on the adventure of a lifetime. And over the course of the next three years, as the fullest expression of God's love, Jesus demonstrates for these 12 disciples what the love of God really looks like. Now, as we follow the life of Jesus in the Gospel of John, we'll see in the latter part of chapter 13, Jesus is nearing the end of his time on earth. And he knows this, but his disciples do not. And so Jesus begins to prepare his disciples for his departure. And in verse 33, he says to them that he's, he's going to be leaving them soon. And they will no longer be able to follow him where he's going. Boom, this is a bombshell he just drops in them. These 11 men who are now with him who have followed him every day, everywhere, for the last three years are now being told it is all coming to an end. They will no longer be able to follow him, and they understandably begin to get very upset. And Jesus, seeing how upset they are becoming, he attempts to comfort them with the words in John chapter 14 in the first four verses, and he says to them, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my father's house, there are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me. So that where I am, there you also will be. You know the way to the place that I'm going. And then in verse 5, we see Thomas, the disciple Thomas, and how panic-stricken, how frightened he is. And he says to Jesus, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? I mean, you've got to read this in the emotional context of what's happening here. Jesus just drops this bombshell on them. He's leaving. They ain't coming. They're frightened, and rightfully so. Thomas turns to him and says, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Now, I want to pause here for just a moment, and I want us to step outside of John chapter 14, and I want to create a little bit of a, of a cultural context for us, because it's really important that you understand the context in which the scriptures were written. And so I want to create a little context here with the hope it's going to enrich your understanding of what exactly is happening here, because what's happening here is very significant to us as followers of Christ. So let me create a little bit of a cultural backdrop. In, in the ancient Middle Eastern culture, which is the culture that the Gospels were written in, when a young man in this culture wanted to get married, when he had a prospect, a girl, that he was interested in, that young man would go to that girl's father and he would express his interest in his daughter. Now, if that father did not see that boy as a viable option, he'd pull a plug on that thing right there. I mean, it was done. However, if he saw him as a possible candidate, that father would then take that young man's interest to his daughter. Now, if she was not interested in most cases, that would be the end of it. However, if she was interested, what would happen next is that father, he would now call a family meeting. Now, you need to understand something about the way ancient Middle Eastern families were structured. They were structured differently than the way we structure our families today in our 21st century postmodern Western world. 
You see, in our world, when two people get married, we think, well, two lives come together, and they form one unit, and then they go off and they create a life of their own together. However, in the ancient Middle Eastern culture, they understood something we have lost sight of. They understood that when two lives came together, more than just two lives came together, two tribes came together, two clans came together, two families came together. And if that girl's family did not want to inherit the baggage of that boy's family, they would say no. Now, something else that's important to understand, when the patriarchal family would have children, when the sons in that family were of marrying age, they would go off and they would find wives for themselves. Now, once they got married, they did not move away. No, they would come back to their parents' house, and they would either build an addition on that home, or they would build a freestanding home somewhere near their parents. And over the course of time, you would end up with these little family compounds that were made up of several dwellings of the different family members. Now, because people married so young in these ancient cultures, in this ancient Middle Eastern culture, people would get married as young as 12 years old. Yeah, as soon as a girl monarched, as soon as she got her first period, she would be put up for marriage. Now, because, in fact, biblical historians tell us that they believe Mary, the mother of Jesus, was no more than 14 years old when she gave birth to Jesus, which meant she would have been pregnant when she was 13 or in the early months of her 14th year. Now, because people married so young, if you lived to be 65, and many people did, that was very common, you'd be a fourth generation person in that family compound. Now, that's a lot of people. So when the father of a household would call a family meeting, more than just mom, dad, sister, and brother would show up for this thing. I mean, you would have a crowd of people there. In fact, if you followed the life of the patriarch Jacob in the book of Genesis, you'll see when Joseph, Jacob's son, who is now prime minister in Egypt, when he calls for his father to pack up his family and come live with him in Egypt, there are 70 people in Jacob's family. Now, in, when Stephen, the martyr in Acts, Acts chapter 7, when he's, before he's martyred and he's recounting Jacob's sojourn, he says there's 75 people in Jacob's family. You could read about this in Genesis chapter 46, verse 27. Now, that's a lot of people. And if that family said, no, this is not a good union, that girl would honor that family's position because she understood there was more than romance that was involved here. However, if they gave their consent, what would happen next is that father now, he would go back to that boy and they would now negotiate what was called the bride price. The bride price. The price that that young man would have to pay that father in order to secure his daughter's hand in marriage. I have four daughters. I like that tradition. But, but, but that didn't work out for me. Now, once that bride price was paid... That marriage was legally done. This is an important thing to remember. Once that bride price was paid, that marriage was legally done. It was a done deal. However, they did not have a celebration, and they would not let that couple consummate their relationship. They wouldn't let them sleep together. What would happen now is that young man, he'd go back to his parents' house, and he'd, he'd either build an addition onto that home or a freestanding home, but however long it took, but when he was finished, when it was ready, he'd go back to that girl's father and let him know everything's finished, everything's ready. Now, that girl's family, they would host a wedding. And depending on the wealth of that family, that wedding could last a day, several days, or as long as a week. But once that wedding celebration is done, that couple was understood to be officially married in the eyes of that community. What would happen next is that boy, he would stay with his bride's family for a while, but when he was ready, he would pack up his bride, pack up her belongings, bring her back to the, his father's house, the family compound. They would set up their home and begin their life together. Okay, with this is a little bit of a cultural backdrop now. Let's step back into John chapter 14. When Jesus tells his disciples that he's going to be leaving them soon, and they are no longer going to be able to follow him, these disciples, they go into a tailspin. This is a crisis moment. They are fearful. They're frightened, and rightfully so. Now, when Jesus sees how frightened they're becoming, he attempts to comfort them with the words of John chapter 14. When he says to them, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house, there's many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. When he says to them, I am going there to prepare a place for you. 
And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, so that where I am, there you also will be. When he says this, he's using wedding language here. This is wedding talk. And you see, the disciples, they understand the language, but they did not understand the context because this takes place during the Passover meal. And this just adds to their confusion because, you see, when Jesus would teach, he would often teach in parables. And you'll often hear uh, the disciples saying, explain to us the parable of the sower. Explain to us the parable of of the weeds. Why do you speak to the people in parables? Because they did not understand these parables either. And now Jesus just drops this terrible news on them. They go into a crisis right here. And now Jesus turns to them and he starts romancing them. He starts talking love talk to them. And they think he's speaking parabolically. They think he's speaking to them in some kind of a parable. But what Jesus is saying to them here in not so cryptic of a fashion, he's saying, look. I am about to go and pay the bride price for you. Come on, church. I'm going to go and pay the bride price for you. And then I'm going to go back to my father's house. And I'm going to build me some rooms. And then I'm coming back for you. Come on, church. Listen. The whole hope. The whole hope of our Christian faith is built upon this very interaction right here. And so you could understand how confused Thomas is when he says, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus then turns to them and he says to them, I am the way. I am the way. I am the most excellent way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you'd know my Father as well. From from now on, you do know him, and you have seen him. But no one has ever seen God. And Jesus is saying, now you've seen him. And then in verse 8, you see Philip and how frightened and scared he is. And he says, Lord, just show us the Father and that'll be enough for us. I mean, can you get a sense of the panic in his voice? He's saying, Jesus, just give us something to hold on to, man. Just show us the Father. That'll be enough for us. Jesus then turns to him in verse 9 and says, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been among you for such a long time. And now here's the verse I want you to to get. This second half of verse 9, this is the verse I want you to take home with you this morning. This is the verse I want you to meditate on throughout the week. Jesus then says to his disciples, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Now when Jesus said this, he wasn't talking about a physical lookalike with the Father. He was talking about the essence, the nature the character of the Father. He was talking about the attributes of God. Jesus, who is the fullest expression of God's love, is now saying to his disciples, if you've seen him, then you've seen what God looks like in his essence, in his nature, in his character, because Jesus has revealed it to them through the attributes of love. Now, my question for you this morning, church, my challenge for you is... Can you make that same statement about yourself? Can you say to your friends at work or at school? Can you say to your neighbors or to the cashier on the checkout line? Can you say to your family members or other members of this church, if you've seen me, then you've seen what God really looks like? If you've seen me, then you've seen the God that I serve? If you watch my behaviors... If you listen to my vocabulary and my self-talk, if you watch the movies I watch, if you visit the websites I visit, if you watch the way I treat my wife, my husband, my children, if you watch the way I treat the disenfranchised or people who are different than I am or less fortunate than I, then you will have seen what the love of God really looks like. Yeah, come on, church. Can you make that same statement about yourself? Would that be enough? Would that be enough to make the people you're talking with want to know your God? 
Or would they simply see you as just somebody who was very religious? And like the men of Athens, would your God remain unknown to them? Now, it is important that we understand how Christ loved because the Bible instructs us to love this way. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verses 1 and 2, it says to be imitators of God and to walk in love like Christ walked in love. Okay, look at the connection here. Listen to the language it's using. It's saying to imitate God, someone you've never seen. How do you imitate God? How do you imitate someone you've never seen? It says you walk in love like Christ walked in love. That's how you imitate God. That's how people see God. So how did Christ walk in love? What did the disciples see? How did they see the Father manifested in the life of Jesus? They saw God manifested through the attributes of love. And what are those attributes? Well, Paul goes on to list them in verses 4 through 7 of 1 Corinthians 13. And I'm going to read them to you as we are bringing our time together to a close. But before I do... It is important that you understand that there need to be two two expressions, two experiences of God's love in your life, too. The first is to understand that God loves you, God's unconditional love for you. For God so loved the world, for God so loved you, he sent his one and only son that if you would believe in him, you would not perish but have everlasting life. You need to know that Jesus paid the bride price for you. That bride price cost him something, and it costs you something. God loves you, and he loves you unconditionally, but that's not a license to continue to sin. God's love for you requires repentance on your part. So you acknowledge that you are a sinful person. Our sin is, sin is the great separator. It separates us from God, and it separates us from one another. And so you confess your sin, you acknowledge that you are a sinful person, you haven't always done it right, and that Jesus went to the cross on your behalf, he paid the price for your sins so you don't have to, and you acknowledge that, and you ask Jesus Christ to come into your life, you surrender your will to his, and he becomes the Lord of your life, and you get the promise of heaven, your spirit is born again, God's spirit takes up residence in your life. So the first expression or experience of God's love for you is to understand that God loves you. Jesus paid the bride price for you. The second expression is how we are to demonstrate that love to those around us, those people who are in our world. And this is where it can get a little uh, confusing. And this is where people end up getting hurt. Now, I want you to understand that God's love is what, for you is what compelled Jesus to the cross. The cross is the culmination of God's love for you. However, when Jesus walked out this love mission on a, day, on a daily basis on the earth, now listen to me, church, he never, he never allowed himself to be abused, manipulated, or taken advantage of. He never allowed anybody to abuse him, although they tried, tried to throw him off a cliff, He never allowed anybody to manipulate him, although the Pharisees and teachers of the law constantly tried. He he never allowed anybody to take advantage of him. In fact, in in Mark's gospel, in uh, Mark chapter 1, we see here that Jesus has just traveled down from Galilee, and he comes into the coastal town of Capernaum. And here he goes over to Peter's house, and he's going to spend the night at Peter's house. Now, this is where Jesus heals Peter's mother-in-law, if you're familiar with that story. Now, Jesus not only heals Peter's mother-in-law, but if you go back and look at that story in Mark chapter 1, you'll see that the entire village showed up at Peter's house. People, the whole village crowded around Peter's house. And Jesus spent the afternoon, the evening, uh, ministering, uh, healing people, uh, casting out demons, breaking strongholds, preaching the good news of the kingdom. And in this context, he also heals Peter's mother-in-law. Now, Jesus spends the night at Peter's house. And early the next morning, while it's still dark, he gets up and he goes out to meet with the Father in prayer. He just goes out to spend time with the Father. And as the sun is rising, as, as the day is dawning, The disciples, they come running up to Jesus, and they're all excited, and they said, Jesus, everybody's looking for you. So what's the implication here? A whole village has come back to Peter's house. They probably brought some more of their friends 
more people who needed healing, more people who needed deliverance, more people who wanted to hear the preaching of the kingdom. And they're saying, Jesus, everybody's looking for you. So the implication is, come on, Jesus. Come on, let's go back and pick up where we left off. Let's go back and keep ministering to these people. And I love what Jesus said to them. In verse 38, listen to what Jesus said. He said to them, this is in, in response to their appeal for Jesus to come and minister. This is what he said to them. He said, listen, he said, Let's go somewhere else. <laughs> Let's go somewhere else. I like that. You see, Jesus, he didn't feel that he needed to minister to everyone who was seeking him, everyone who was asking something of him. We see very clearly in the scriptures that part of walking in love like Christ walked in love is to have boundaries around your life so that people don't hurt you or take advantage of you. Listen, there is too much abuse that is taking place in the body of Christ today because people think that in order for them to walk in love like Christ walked in love, they have to let people take advantage of them. They have to let people mistreat them. And listen to me, friends, that's bad theology. That is a doctrine of demons. Jesus never taught that. Jesus tells us in John 16, 33, in this world, you're going to have tribulation, right? That's God's way of saying life is hard. Can we all agree with that? Okay, life is hard. People are going to hurt us. And the Bible does say we're to bless those who curse us. We're to pray for those who despitefully use us. So what's this implying? It's implying when you're living in this fallen world, there's going to be people who are going to curse you, people who are going to despitefully use you. So when they do that, you speak a blessing over their life. You pray for them. And then listen, then you put a boundary up around your life so that people don't hurt you like that anymore. Do not let the devil use people like that to distract you, to distract you from what God's calling you to do, to drain you, to suck the energy out of you, suck the life out of you, drain you of your emotional energy. You do, what, you, you do what Jesus told his disciples to do in Matthew 10, 14. People treat you like that, bless them, pray for them, put a boundary around your life, then shake the dust off your feet and get them out of your life. Okay, with that said, I just had to say that little disclaimer. I want to read to you this list of love's attributes. This is 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7. And while I'm reading this to you, if you're comfortable, you could close your eyes, but the idea here is I just want, I don't want you to be distracted. I just want you to hear these words. And as I'm reading them, as you're hearing them, let them go down into your spirit and you ask the Father. You pray and you say, God, show me where in my life these attributes need to be more clearly visible. Who are the people what are the circumstances in my life where these attributes need to be more clearly seen without allowing myself to be abused, manipulated, or taken advantage of? Okay, beginning in verse 4. Listen. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not boast. Love is not proud. Love is not rude. Love is not self-seeking. Love is not easily angered. Love keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil. Love rejoices with the truth. Love always protects. Love always trusts. Love always hopes. Love always perseveres. Okay, now think about it, church. Why are we instructed to walk in love like Christ walked in love? We are instructed to love this way so that people will be able to see Christ in us the way the disciples were able to see the Father in Jesus. And that kind of love, friend, that kind of love, that makes a person thirsty for more. That's the kind of love that can call a person out of darkness. 
That's the kind of love that can break bondages. That's the kind of love that can set captives free. That's the kind of love that gives sight to the spiritually blind. That's the kind of love that can restore relationships. That's the kind of love that gives a hope and a reason for living. And that is the kind of love, as Paul said in closing, that is the kind of love that never fails. Yeah. Amen. Now listen, as I, I want to pray with you before I, I step down. Now to love like Jesus loved, that's not natural. It's not easy to do. You can't do it in your own natural self. This is why you need the spirit of Christ living within you. Because then the attributes of Christ can be expressed through you. And so maybe you're here this morning and you've never taken that step of asking Jesus Christ to come into your life so that his Holy Spirit will take up residence in your life. And listen, friend, he will change your life. And you may be thinking, no, I don't know how he can do that. No, you don't know how he can do it, but God knows how he can do it. God knows what needs to be done. God can clean up the mess. God can make crooked paths straight. He can open doors that no man can open. He can shut doors that no man can shut. God can clean up the mess. He can clean up your mess and give you a message out of it. God can do that. And if you're here this morning, listen to me. Listen, listen. If you want to take that step, and if you want to say, yes, I want Jesus Christ to come into my life. I want to ignore, I, conf- I admit I am a sinful person, and God, I confess my sin to you. I acknowledge you died on the cross for my sin, and I'm asking you to forgive me and to come into my life. That's the prayer right there. If you're willing to pray that prayer this morning, raise your hand so I can see you. I want to pray with you. I am so proud of you, church. I am so proud of you. That is the right thing to do. That's the right thing to do. I see your hands. That's the right thing to do. You put your hand down. You put your hand down, and I want you to pray with me, okay? Pray this to yourself. You don't pray it out loud. Pray it to yourself. Just focus on the Lord now, and you say, God, thank you for sending Jesus to die for my sins, of which there are many, and I ask you to please forgive me of my sins. Forgive me, God. I believe in the cross. I believe that cross was the penalty for my sin. And I believe in the empty tomb. And I believe in the resurrected Jesus. And God, I'm asking you to come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. Come into my life. Now let your Holy Spirit take up residence in my life. Let my body now be the holy of holies of your spirit. And God, help me to do that which in my natural self I can't do. I just simply can't do it. Help me to love like Jesus loved. And help me to just walk in a joy that I haven't had in years. God, I pray that you just fill me with your spirit of joy, a joy that I haven't had in years. God, and I pray for for those this morning, if there's been any stronghold over their life because of whatever the sin issues were that held them back, that right now, on the authority of that empty tomb, that stronghold is broken. Just like that. Broken. It's broken. Come on. It's broken. It's just going to fall off your life. And when they, we stand up in a moment, God, I pray people will feel lighter. Oh, God, and, and for those who have prayed that prayer, God, let it be the dawning of a new day. God, you're going to take away that heart of stone. You're going to give them a heart of flesh. And help them to be sensitive now to your spirit. Give them spiritual eyes. Take the scales off their eyes and give them spiritual vision now. Help them to see things they couldn't see before. Spiritual things. Help them to understand things they couldn't understand before. Give them a sensitivity that they haven't had before. And fill them with your joy. The joy that's so unspeakable and full of glory. They just can't make sense out of it. And help them to walk in that joy. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Hey, thank you so much, church. I love you. I love you.